Howdy, folks. Um, welcome to the first uh, talk of after Keith's introduction. Um, I'm Vern Paxson. I'm a longtime Zeeker. Um, it's amazing to be here for the 25th year of Zeek. I'm going to uh, give a sketch about how to think about Zeke's performance. Um, and in particular, uh, Zeke's always targeted, since its original design, uh, the ability to monitor traffic um, at uh, very high data rates. And to think about, well, how fast can it go? It's important to appreciate that there's a bunch of quite different components that are all working in concert to um, achieve the system's functionality. And you can only go as fast as the slowest one of those. Um, or in, in fact, you know, that will dominate uh, your performance. So what I want to do in this talk is go through the implications of Zeek's architecture, how the system is designed in general. And I'm going to start with the original architecture. That's it's, it's a sort of conceptually simpler than the modern architecture. And then I'll go into, well, how has that architecture evolved and what are the performance implications? And then I want to spend a bit of time on um, some current work that I've been doing on speeding up scripting. And tomorrow there will be a, a deeper technical uh, dive into that that work. And overall, the the goal here is that you come away with you know it's just useful ways to think about the system and start a, a, having a sense of what to expect in terms of its performance. All right, so this is the architecture of the system as originally designed, and we start with we're capturing packets from the network. Um, through uh, the NIC or some sort of tap that's feeding it into a network interface card. Then the kernel and, uh, is filtering the traffic to a subset that's of interest. And in and, and the original design, that, that was really crucial because the uh, uh, systems at the time had no ability really to deal with the full data rates of an active link. So the filtering would uh, select particular, for example, particular ports. That filtered stream goes into what we call the event engine or the core. Um, and this is doing a lot of work in taking the filtered stream and turning it into um, distilled descriptions of behavior uh, at various semantic levels. <clears throat> These events and so they're called events because they're asynchronous. They just happen as the traffic occurs. These events have no notion of good or bad associated with them. They're just, this is what happened. And so I've got some examples there, which could all be from a single connection that a connection was attempted like uh, a TCP event, it, it, an HTTP reply happened. Inside the reply, there was a data item, which is called a file in uh, Zeek lingo and uh, you get the hash of the file and, and maybe the file was a uh, Windows PE and you're getting the actual code <clears throat> of that. So these events can have different semantic levels. Um, there's about 650 of them currently. This part then is taking that big stream, turning it into the events and sending them up into an interpreter that's going to interpret scripts that are written in Zeke's custom scripting language. And the scripts take the events and their parameters and make decisions about what to do uh, in a general purpose programming language. So they'll incorporate a state that has of what's been seen in the past and perhaps additional input sources, various ways, and take action of some sort. So one thing they can do is generate logs and uh, Zeek spits, spits out dozens of different types of logs today. Uh, can generate real-time alerts, which are called notices and can execute programs um, in, in, in to be reactive to what's going on. This log um, export is uh, has emerged at the time, it wasn't so clear when the system was designed, as the far and away the number one use case is to get those logs. Um, but the others have utility too, of course. And it, it's useful to keep in mind that <coughs> scripting is heavily used in the system. So today, 
um, just the stock Zeek comes with about nearly 50,000 lines of scripts. All right, that's how the system originally uh, worked. And, and the performance implications, actually I should go back to it, though I'll, I'll summarize this in a bit. Each of these pieces is crucial in terms of how much uh, performance it delivers. These arrows get narrower as we go up, meaning there's less volume of stuff, but there's more work that has to be done for each uh, at each stage. So there's a, there's this balance. You have to do more work on less stuff or uh, less work on more stuff. Um, making it all performant then is uh, tricky. You got to pay attention to all of those pieces. Okay, that was the original architecture. Today it looks a little more involved. First off, you don't necessarily have just one instance of that architecture running, but a bunch. And the, the scalability comes from what we call Z cluster, which is the ability to spread the execution across multiple systems or multiple cores inside a single system. So this requires a front end that has to be very high performance packet broker or a load balancing NIC in order to distribute the traffic. The filtering stage is pretty much gone. So that used to be there to um, uh, cherry pick the most interesting traffic and uh, get a big gain in terms of offload by doing that. Uh, we subsequently added the ability for Zeek to dynamically figure out what protocol is running in a given connection regardless of its port, which meant there's no longer any opportunity to filter by port. So that stage has uh, disappeared. However, um, in some high performance um, uh, deployments, a technique called shunting is used instead, which is dynamic filtering where the um, uh, scripting can communicate to the NIC, this flow, I, I, this high volume of flow is not sufficiently interesting for to be worth the uh, processing it requires. So don't bother me with any more of its packets. So it's a way of dynamically uh, winnowing down the traffic. The um, event engine and, and scripting have been heavily extended. So there's a, a great deal of library functionality, about 450 uh, functions that can be called and uh, frameworks that uh, organize the use of these functions. And we've added the ability to extend the system with packages, um, which include both uh, plugin C++ code that's going to run here in the event engine and in those uh, library functions and scripts that are running um, at this level. So that, that's the overall uh, nature of the architecture. And if I were to summarize this then in terms of performance implications, uh, we've got four areas to think about, all of which um, need to go fast. So there's packet dispatch. How do we actually get the traffic to the um, whichever worker is going to process it? And that's going to depend on our NIC and our operating system and uh, perhaps our packet, packet broker, depending how we've designed that. There's the event engine, which is all the C++ code running on the traffic stream. And here we have both the uh, sort of stock event engine code that ships to the system, and then any plugin components that might be hooked into the event engine's processing. There's interpreting those scripts. This is a C++ code that is going, and I'll illustrate this in a minute, that um, is going to recursively uh, interpret uh, trees, data structures that are trees that represent the scripts. And here there's the stock scripts and also again packages. And finally, there's built-in functions that the scripts may call, which can um, sometimes uh, can take a lot of processing. For example, the whole logging um, infrastructure is built-in functions and uh, can consume quite a bit of cycles. So all of, all of this needs to go fast for the system to go fast. Um, the part I'm now going to turn to in the second half of this talk is this third step. So interpreting programs is uh, fraught with performance questions because interpreting, while very flexible and easy to build, is um, uh, one level removed from uh, direct execution and can go slow. So I'm going to talk about can we speed up this interpreting. 
here is a, a, a script that I'm going to use to illustrate uh, some of the concepts. So this is just a simple function. It takes two parameters, A and B. There are types of integers. And it's going to return an integer. And it's just going to do this little test on their values and return uh, the result. So that, that script um, isn't really doing very much turns into this tree that represents all of the elements of the script. And the tree has 18 nodes. Um, and so then to evaluate this every time the function is called uh, is going to, um, uh, the interpreter will take, well, what are the arguments to the function and assign them to these local variables. Um, and then it is going to walk the tree to uh, determine values at each stage. And I'm not gonna go through that in depth because of time, but the bottom line is for this function, each time you call it, there's gonna be 12 uh, C++ calls that are needed. They might be inline, so they might be fast, but 12 of them. Uh, 16 memory management um, increments and decrements. This is for reference counting to track um, dynamic memory and four creations or destructions of and destructions of val objects. Those are the objects that are um, the abstraction of values used inside Zeek. So the core idea to speed this up is let's use a lower level representation than these trees. And, and essentially what we're gonna do is change the trees into something that's a lot more like interpreted assembly language. Um, and the, the decision I made was to go with um, a, our own custom assembly language rather than an existing framework out there like LLVM to keep the tool chain simple so that um, users would not need to separately compile the, their scripts, that it would all be done inside uh, Zeek, um, <clears throat> a single instance of Zeek. So the, this uh, abstract uh, assembly language we're, we're generating was called ZAM, Zeek um, Abstract Machine. And then also to speed up, we're gonna need a bunch of optimizations and uh, change the low level representation of how values are represented. I'm not gonna talk in depth about that, um, that, that second. So what are these optimizations? Well, for example, the um, uh, repeated computations can be computed once and then reused. That's a um, conceptually straightforward optimization. It's not something though that the interpreter does today. Um, if there are constants in expression that allow you to evaluate the expression fully, replace the expression with um, its value given those constants, compute that at compile time. Uh, if a value is computed, do the work to compute it, but you don't use it, get rid of it. Um, if variables uh, don't overlap in their use, you can uh, double up their uh, the memory used for them. And this has some savings both in terms of memory and also in terms of performance for more subtle reasons. <clears throat> and then a um, potentially big one is to take any function calls that the script makes to other script functions and inline those um, to avoid the overhead of doing the function call and to identify opportunities to optimize. So that gives you the flavor of where we're going with this. So this was the original example I had where there's the tree and it's got 18 nodes. And this is the same thing in XAM. So it's turned into nine uh, uh, Zam instructions, you can get sort of, if you look at them, you get the flavor of more like assembly code. And this was the original cost of executing that function, 12 C++ calls, 16 memory management increments for vowels. And if we do it instead in Zam code, it's one function call to, to the thing itself, um, six or seven trips around a loop that's going to do a switch on the opcode of the instructions and one val creation or zero if this function gets inlined. So it's potentially a, a quite significant gain. All right, so what is the status of all this work? Um, the main work is done. You can get it off of 
this branch in uh, GitHub, um, topic burn script op. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here. It's about 24,000 lines of code. And which I was struck is actually bigger than the entire original implementation of Zeek, which was 22,000 lines way back in 1998 um, when the paper came out. Um, and uh, it needs still a bunch of polish, a bunch of updates. So uh, right now um, I'm uh, working with the um, uh, core team about, okay, what, what are the right ways to the, um, soundly integrate all that code into uh, Zeek Master. Um, I think some of those changes will come pretty soon. The whole bulk of it though may take quite a while. Um, and I'd love to have some volunteers to run this um, in, in various ways. And, and there's both, hey, is it uh, executing correctly, which is hugely important. And then does it gain performance? There's a profile option that can be used to um, uh, identify opportunities maybe where uh, the performance could be better, so forth like that. So it'd be great to have volunteers. Um, ideally, this will be an experimental feature with Zeek 4.0. Talk about uh, that on uh, roadmap stuff tomorrow. Um, there's complexities with that, so I'm not, not sure we'll pull that off. And then, of course, you know, the question is, well, how much faster is it? And to um, put that in perspective, let's go back to this. We're saying, well, you know, Zeke spends its time in four areas and we sped up that area. So, so that part is a lot faster. It's, um, you know, three to 10 times faster depending on what you're doing. Um, but all that other stuff didn't get sped up or not very much. Turns out there's a little bit of speed up for the event engine and the built-in functions, but, but not a lot. Um, and so, you know, what, what is the speed gain? Well, it just really heavily depends on what, and this is the general uh, answer when people say, how fast is Zeek? Um, it just hugely depends, unfortunately. It'd be great if there was a simple way to put it, but there isn't. So it depends on what traffic you're going to analyze and what configuration, what stuff you've turned on in various ways. However, <clears throat> what I think is exciting about this is it means that um, going forward, we can be more bold about how much stuff we do in scripting because I think um, the reality is we've avoided certain things in scripting because we thought, yeah, I just can't afford the performance. And now the performance is more affordable. So we can do um, more forms of analyses than, um, that we have in the past because they're not going to have such a significant impact. Um, and with that, I am done. And I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation off in Slack. So I will see you there.